My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the March 12th, 2024 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at, the discre at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Audit Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making a seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Present. Ms. Frempong. Present. Mr. Young. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Thank you. A uh, quorum being present. We will begin. Ms. Jamison, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Present. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew? Present. Mr. Edwards? Present. Ms. Smith? Present. Mr. Hartlove? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Ms. Forsman? Present. Dr. Lewis? Dr. Jones? Mr. Fannin? Present. We also have a guest attending from Clifton Larson Allen, Ms. Sherry Amos. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? No, hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Great, thank you, Ms. Jamison. Item number two, opening remarks. Good afternoon. If committee members have questions that are outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or or me with your questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get the answers to your questions. Item number three, reports. Ms. Manna, please proceed with the Special Education Dispute Resolution Audit Report. Okay, let me make sure I've got the right, okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And good afternoon, board members, staff, and guests. My name is Andrea Manna, and I was one of the auditors on this project, along with Ashley Smith, who is a senior auditor in our office. And today we'd like to present our audit results of the special education dispute resolution process. We'd also like to get, thank um, the following special ed and office of law staff for being here today. We have um, Ms. Allison Myers, the executive director of Department of Special Education, and Ms. Pamela, Pamela Forsman, attorney of the office of law. Um, at this time, I'd also like to note that this audit report is posted on our website and it's on board docs with tonight's meeting agenda if you would like to review it in more detail. Our audit objective was to determine if eligible children and their families are supported through IDEA, which is Individuals with Education Disabilities Education Act dispute resolution processes. Additionally, we determined if the process is implemented by the Office of Law complied with COMAR and BCPS standard operating procedures. In conducting the audit, we worked with both the Office of Compliance in the Department of Special Education and the Office of Law. They work collaboratively to ensure that compliance with state and federal statutes and regulations for the dispute resolution process. Our audit identified eight commendations and two findings. Additionally, an analysis of statistical data related to the dispute resolution process for special education mediation and due process hearings was completed, and we'll review these results together in a moment. But now I would like to turn it over to Ashley to first review some background information within this audit and our data analysis results. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> Before we get into the results, I would like to review some quick background information about the dispute resolution processes. When a parent files a request for mediation and or due process hearing, there are options to them. 
which are all explained in the Maryland Procedural Safeguards Notice Document. This document is provided to all parents at least annually at their IEP meeting. The options provided to the parents include filing a state complaint with MSDE or a request for mediation and or due process hearing with Office of Administrative Hearings. These options have different rules and procedures. Mediation is a voluntary process to resolve disagreements between the parents and BCPS through a mediator. Both parties must agree to any resolution. A state complaint is submitted to MSDE, which alleges that BCPS has violated Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and state and federal, federal regulations. Due process is a formal complaint that identifies or evaluates the educational placement or provisions of a free appropriate public education or FAPE for a student with a disability. The special education dispute resolution process follows the list of applicable regulations that you see here on the screen. Okay. Now on to the data an analysis. Our first chart is on the number of mediation and due process cases per school year from school year 2019 through school year 2023. Overall, the number of dispute resolution cases have been consistent, except for school year 2020 and 21 due to COVID. School year 24 is already on track to remain consistent with 40 cases filed as of January of 24. The second chart is on the total number of special education students to the number of cases filed per, per, school, per school year. This was to show that the number of cases is a small percent of the total population. It also explains that even if the population increases, that is not a direct reflection of the number of cases filed. The third chart was to show the budget to actual dollars spent on settlements. The actual spent on settlements was 113%, 154%, and 140% of their respective year's budget. The budget and actual spending amounts also fund services to provide FAPE for students who are privately placed. The last dispute cases that were resolved or withdrawn prior, prior to trial. This was to represent the work that BCPS does to resolve complaints or have them withdrawn before a scheduled hearing. This reduces additional costs that could come from litigations. Ms. Myers, do you have anything that you would like to add regarding the charts? Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. No, thank you very much. I think that's fine. Okay. Now I will turn it back over to Andrea to review the commendations and findings. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Now I'd like to review the commendations in this audit, and the commendations are areas within our audit that we reviewed, but there were no exceptions or findings. And first, we'd like to thank both the Office of Compliance and the Department of Special Education and the Office of Law Personnel with their prompt responses during the audit process. Both Jason and Twanda were very helpful and respons responsive to us, so thank you on that. And as part of our audit, we reviewed the communications to the public, parents, and the community, and we determined that the information related to the dispute resolution process and the options are provided to families on the, on the Department of Special Education's website. We also reviewed special education and Office of Law's standard operating procedures and determined that they include the required communications to families through the annual IEP meetings. Additionally, when a parent files for mediation and due process, there's a packet of information that's required by COMAR that is sent by the law office, and all of these steps are part of their standard operating procedures. Our audit included a review of the budget monitoring related to the dispute resolution and settlement cases, and we determined that special education monitors budget accounts and that are used to pay for case settlements as a result of the dispute resolution process. They also approved upon, improved upon these processes and are now monitoring the actual spending by each case. And this will help approve upon the spending since the tracking is done on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Our audit noted that the Department of Special Education has a process in place to work with the schools and parents to try to resolve any issues before the dispute resolution options are even offered. Furthermore, once an official complaint is filed, both the Office of Compliance and the Office of Law have good monitoring processes in place to ensure that all cases are tracked and handled according to the applicable regulations. Our audit also included a review of the various standard operating procedures within both of the offices, and we determined that they are all in line with the Comar regulations. We also reviewed a sample of cases that went through the state complaint process, and we determined that the Department of Special Education followed the applicable steps in Comar and their SOPs for these cases, including the requirement of addressing any applicable corrective actions within, the one, within one year. Okay, now we're going to move on to the findings section of the report. The first finding is re related to FAPE, which is the free and appropriate public education not being provided. For two of the eight dispute resolution cases reviewed, FAPE was not provided to the student. Related services were not able to be provided to these students in accordance to their IEP. Therefore, BCPS incurred additional costs to pay for compensatory services owed to the student. So our make sure it's showing on the screen. Our recommendation is for the Department of Special Education to identify the special education related services that are needed on an annual basis and determine if the current allocation of BCPS resources can fulfill these related services needs. If not, then the Department of Special Education should ensure that the related services are available in a timely manner through the use of third party providers. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Myers to review um, Department of Special Education's corrective action. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. So um, just for to, to clarify, the, the findings that were found um, related to the point in time where we were um, in need for, a need of additional contractual providers to provide related services um, due to vacancies um, of those service providers in our system. Um, so a contract for related services was obtained in summer of 2022, which allowed for procurement of contractual services for various related service providers. Um, and in beginning in fall 2023, um, we are proud to say that we were fully staffed with related service providers due to use of both full-time um, FTEs, so our own employees, as well as contractual providers. So um, this is something that we've been able to resolve and move forward with um, staffing being in place. Okay, thank you. And our second and final finding is related to providing proper notifications to the party following a dispute. So for seven of the 15 dispute resolution cases that we reviewed, the notification acknowledging that the complaint was received in the Office of Law was not sent to the party that submitted the complaint. And here our recommendation is for the Office of Law to update their standard operating procedures, which they've already completed that where applicable, and to ensure that these standard operating procedures are communicated and followed, especially when there's a transition of staff or turnover. And now I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Forsman to review their corrective action plan here. Hi, everyone. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Barr, Ms. Manna, and Ms. Smith for working with us, for collaborating with us through this process. As a result of the audit, um, the Office of Law Paralegal, Tawanda Crudup, and I reviewed the standard operating procedures concerning acknowledgement of mediations and due process hearing requests for consistency with the Code of Maryland regulations. Code of Maryland regulations, or COMAR, requires that a local educational agency, a school system, provide an acknowledgement to a party that files a due process hearing request. Comart does not require a school system to send acknowledgement when a parent or a party files only for mediation. The acknowledgement, which is composed of a letter, um, procedural safeguards, and a list of free and low cost representation sources is required when a due process hearing request is filed. And we found that the Office of Law standard operating procedure had required acknowledgement when a parent or a party files just a mediation request, as well as due process hearing requests. So this was not consistent with COMAR, which does not require an acknowledgement 
for mediation requests. So as a result, we have revisited our standard operating procedures to and we have revised them to remove the direction to acknowledge mediation requests and reflect that acknowledgement is sent to a party only when a due process hearing request is filed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Morsman. So that is the end of our presentation for this audit. If committee members have any questions related to, to the dispute resolution process or our audit, we or management would be happy to answer them at this time. Committee members, any questions? This is board member Frempong. I have some Yes, please, questions. Ms. Frempong. Thank you. Um, just in trying to understand when I was reading through the report, so I'll start off with, I think it's great that the special education has now at the start of the school year, we are fully staffed with those service providers. Um, but I was trying to understand some of what the, what the, um, the diagrams um, with the data analysis where it asked about the numbers for the special education population. It gave it as a um, the cases as a percentage. Um, and so I was just trying to understand like for the students included in the special education population, is it only students who are specifically identified as having a disability? Because on page five within the me mediation, it says there are students who are suspected of having a disability can also re request mediation. So that population and the percentage is it only for students actually identified with a uh, disability? Is this the chart you're referring to with the number of special education students involved? Cases yeah. Involved? Okay. Yep. So there's the data analysis there. And then a little bit further up on page five, when it talks about the mediation, it says um, it talks about the the mediation can also be for students who um, are suspected of having a disability. I'm sorry, it's that's your page five in my PDF. Oh, I'm sorry. Page five. It's page so, six. OK, is it? Um, I'm trying to find where it's OK, at. so it's before the data analysis graph where it gives the definitions of like, I think it's mediation. Um, yep, right there. So that piece there with the mediation, because it says it's a student with a disability or a student suspected of having a disability. So some a parent could file for mediation if they suspect that their, stu their child has a disability, but they don't currently have an IEP, so they would not be in the IEP population at that time, but perhaps they they feel like their student has a disability and they may may they have the choice to file for mediation. OK, so then in that data analysis. OK, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll wait. Is that correct, Ms. Forsman? Is that what you're yes. going to respond? Thank okay. you. I, I would agree with you, Ms. Mana, um, and, and it may be where an IEP team has assessed and determined that the student does not meet the requirements of the IDEA. And at that point, if the parent, you know, wants to move forward and file a due process hearing request, if, if they disagree with that, that would be a due process hearing request. From the school system's perspective, however, they do not view that student as being eligible for special education services. The very nature of the parent's complaint, however, is that they are that they are disagreeing with that finding. OK, so then for the data analysis on the following page where it talks about it as a percentage. Um, yes, that bottom graph. So then the. The cases filed can include a student with a disability and a student without a disability, but then for the population, it's only going to be students with the identified disability. Correct. Yes, correct. This chart, this chart here will be just the actual students that are within special education, so that have an IEP. That was what this chart shows. OK, thank you. You're welcome. And then, um, 
the next thing I was just trying to understand. So for the, so there is now the monitoring that's been put in place um, to where it said um, the budget is monitored monthly and that information is communicated with the Office of Budget and Finance. That is in response to what's happening. But for all of the, from the one chart where it actually showed the budget and what was actually spent, what we spent was actually always over. And then the current budget is 4 million, but the actual show 4.6 million for 2022 and then 5.1 million for 2023. So how is the response of communicating with the Office of Budget and Finance addressing that issue? Ms. Myers, would you like to um, jump in and talk about that process a little yeah. bit? <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. So, hi, um, nice to hear from you. Um, I want to acknowledge I'm in my car right before the curriculum um, presentation tonight at Woodlawn High School, so that's why I'm sitting here, guys, in the parking lot, so just want to clarify what's happening here. Um, but, yeah, so we do have a process in place to monitor um, with regards to um, our dispute resolution process. Um, we are actually in a place of calling it legal resolution because as indicated in the report that there's a couple of there's there's um things we often we settle for a couple of different reasons so it might be of a dispute resolution because of a filing for mediation or due process claim um we also the same budget line is used for which is what's here for students that are in need of um a non-public setting or a um, specialized type of school environment that might be um, in order to provide a free and appropriate public education that is a agreed upon um, services that are maybe outside of the typical non-public process. So um, that also, that amount for tuition is also included in this amount. So in order to talk about, you know, as far as monitoring of it, we do have a set budget that we do um, monitor monthly with regards to what our spending is. Um, we also are able to, with increased monitoring processes, have an, uh, you know, really keep a close eye on how much if we have, for example, a student that may have um, an agreement that might last two years, for example, the remainder of one year and the next, we would budget for this year and then also be able to project how that hits for the following year. Um, we are in a spot that unfortunately there are times where due to um, the uh, needs that might arise or the concerns that may arise that we are in a place where we are having to um, pay beyond what is then that um, budgeted amount and the system then supports us with that. Um, so that, you know, that is as far as response, that, that is how we're monitoring it. But some of these things are, um, we where I want to focus is that the importance of how we reduce that risk. Right, so that's with the implementation of um, IEPs. I'm hopeful with like the addition of that IEP facilitator, being able to support with um, professional learning, um, with support with families feeling um, that their kind of needs could be answered right at the team table and not needing to go through the dispute resolution process. Some of those other, you know, when I talk about professional learning kind of across the system, um, increase the kind of accountability. Those are all those things that we talk about as far as within our strategic steps are those things that are then impacted that we should be able to see um, decreases in spending related to this like dispute resolution. For this this school year, which we know was not, not part of this monitoring, um, we are down about 20, I think 24% in our mediation filings just on their own. So that's a really good sign. Um, and again, you know, that, that, that kind of speaks to why we wanna continue our work around our parent engagement, et cetera. Um, and parent information sessions and all of that just to, so that we empower our families to feel part of the process and that also knowing that we can work with them to um, resolve any concerns they have, hopefully before we get to a fiscal, a fiscal impact would be the goal. Thank you. So if I kind of oversimplify a little bit of what you said, but just so I can make sure that I understand. So I did see you know where I the footnotes is. <laughs> <laughs> So the footnote says that, right, the private placements are included in that number. And so if I yeah. understand what you're saying, that the idea is that in trying to be more responsive on that front end with making sure that we're meeting the needs of our special education students and hoping, I guess, to reduce getting to the point where we have issues with resolution and it then ends up 
going to a private placement. I guess that's kind of what the idea yeah. is we do. Okay. Right. What I'm speaking to is kind of what are those things we're putting in place to be able to reduce the risk, but also acknowledging that that budget has like two lines there. One is for the cost associated coming out of a dispute resolution. The other is for when we may have used um, funds to be able to support a family that might be actually be at a, sometimes it's a reduced cost to be able to settle and look at a FAPE option for a student in the meantime, but they both hit that line. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the last piece, I guess, would be for the law office. Um, so for thank you for the explanation, because I think that answered one of my questions. Um, and again, it kind of goes back to, to families who are not understanding about special education yet to where they actually had their student identified as a special education student. So yes, we have it on our website that um, the, I guess the information and then the information is also provided annually at an IEP. But then that means the student has already been diagnosed and, you know, has a plan. So what kind of information is available to parents who have not yet, I hate to say gotten into the queue, but like they're not yet in this system of an understanding about special education, but yet, you know, again, because the mediation is available for someone who suspects their child may have a disability, how do they get the information so that they can be more informed if their child is not yet officially have a have a diagnosis and a disability? Right, and I think, yeah, I think Allison is gonna chime in about the process within the school system, within the schoolhouse. Did you wanna jump in, Allison? Sure, I was gonna say, I know she said it was for law, but I don't mind taking this one, Pam. <laughs> Um, so it's a couple. It, it, there's a couple of layers to this. One is um, that the child find we are obligated as a system around child find, right? So that that starts at any point. You might see in doctors' offices, you might see in preschool settings, as well as um, in community settings. We talk about child find, and that there's a one point single point of entry in order to access that. It doesn't even have to be. It might be the doctor calling to say that there's a concern with regards to. Um, developmental, you know, any kind of level of concern, and then it automatically comes to referral, and then a team is held to look at that initial eligibility. So schools are also obligated around that. So if there's any consideration of that, then we're obligated to um, review um, for that initial eligibility. A lot of times in the schoolhouse, um, well, not a lot, we also always look to what are those things that can be put in place and interventions and things that may be pre the IEP team, but ultimately, if there's a concern, we are obligated to come to team to review that. Um, so, so that's kind of that child find process, and Pam, feel free to jump in on if I missed anything in that. Yeah, I was going to say there are a lot of things that are happening in the schoolhouse, and they kind of come together, they kind of converge. The, the tier one, tier two, tier three interventions that teachers may be putting into place to address a student who is struggling academically. Then there's also student support teams um, where that that may be inviting the parent to talk about what's happening, um, what's what's happening in the schoolhouse. There may be behaviors that those behaviors may be a result of something that's not being addressed, maybe an impact from a disability. Um, in addition to that, we know that schoolhouse communities uh, parent teacher associations, there are lots of resources within the schoolhouse um, that the parent may see, may hear, and can access. And then in addition, there's resources in the community and from Maryland State Department of Education talking about special education, um, their, their website, and all of their resources that parents can access. And I, and I believe we also have liaisons within our within the school system to provide uh, to provide education and training to parents. We've had Disability Rights Maryland come and speak, uh, as well as Project Heal and other representatives. So there's there's lots of lots of ways to get the message out and to engage parents in that discussion. And I just was going to add that uh, you know that added part of that is that when we talk about those um, kind of like three priority areas related to the strategic plan, um, and we look at that priority of like that the third kind of pillar there, right, is around the, um, the idea that really that parent engagement where we've leaned into that. So I think where we've seen increased 
Um, you know, we just, we did a, a podcast on dispute resolution, right, for that idea. Um, and also ensuring that we want families kind of carrying through the process. So we may have families that are um, eligible for infants and toddler services that um, as part of their transition, um, they're de they then are determined eligible or not for special education services and ensuring that during that transition process that we are providing all of the necessary information, we are required to share all of that information so that parents can make informed decisions. Also acknowledging that it's complicated and confusing and it can be overwhelming for families. So we also are really trying to lean into um, our communication and advocacy around for families to feel that they are empowered as far as part of the process and to know where to go to if they have questions. Um, so that is, you know, that's, that's really a, a large portion of our work. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note for clarification is that even at that initial eligibility meeting, they're provided a copy of those procedural safeguards and, are, and then our things are explained to them. So even if it's your first time at that team table, the, the expectation is that those are reviewed and ensured that folks understand it. So that's a huge part for those, that initial eligibility, which even if they don't qualify yet, those procedural safeguards come into play and are reviewed and explained. And if there's any questions at all that they should be answered. Right, I was gonna say there are multiple safety nets and that yeah. is if, if they are attending an IEP meeting um, and maybe it's the initial one, they are going to get that procedural safeguards. And it's a, it's a wonderful resource and really lays out all of the steps and all of the entitlements and the rights. Um, so, and you you also find this on our website so that's another place where uh, parents can find information if they're if they're curious and concerned. Good question. Yeah. Thank you, and I really appreciate the thorough response. And I think it's helpful as well for any parents who, you know, if they come back to listen to this, mm -hmm. um, if they, you know, having questions about this report, and then also being able to hear, um, you know, this type of information. So. Thank you. And last question about this. It's not the last question for the session, unfortunately, but <laughs> for this one. Um, so the, um, the, what is it called? The um, corrective action. So the corrective action for, um, because for mediation, if I understood it correctly, it said mediation did not require certain paperwork, but a due hearing process did. And that was um, in alignment with COMAR. And so it sounds like we as a system have changed that to be consistent with COMAR. And so while typically I am all for that, I guess my concern becomes, um, cause I'd rather have it be more communication, right? And parents having a better understanding than less. So my concern with that particular step is then, um, I guess, do we go back to what you guys just spoke about as far as parents getting information or having resources um, for the places you just identified? Because now if we're moving forward, a parent, if they're asking for mediation and not mm -hmm. the due process hearing, they're not gonna have that, that uh, paperwork sent to them. Right, so that's a, that's a very good point. I, I think that Comar is set up this way so that because at mediation, it you are meeting with an administrative law judge who is not there as a judge, but as a mediator. And at that time, you talk about everything and, um, and try to resolve. And it's a very positive leaning in type of environment and discussion. Uh, so, uh, the administrative law judges really do a wonderful job and and the parties speak candidly if the matter does not resolve at that point in time the parent is advised about the next the next piece if they want to go forward they would have to file a due process hearing request and then they would receive that packet of information which as as I explained, is an acknowledgement letter and the procedural safeguards, as well as the free and low cost or reduced um, legal resources. So um, what we found is that they 
parents also receive the free and low cost legal resources at the IEP team table. So they are receiving this information. Um, it's just that at mediation, the matter may resolve. And if it does not, it actually ends right there. The parent at that point in time decides whether they're going to move forward with the due process hearing request. At that point, then they would be receiving really the procedural safeguards again, as well as the reduced, um, the free and reduced uh, legal resources information. So. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. And that's it for my questions for this one. Thank you. Uh, committee members, any other questions? Okay, I have a couple things I want to say. Um, I taught school for 35 years. I've listened to this report. I've listened to the questions. I've listened to the answers. And I'll be quite honestly, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I just, and I'm receiving questions from the public. So what I'm going to do, and, and I thought initially that I was going to ask some of these questions now, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to construct those in a and an email, and I'm going to send them to Miss Barr, and you know she can answer the ones specifically uh, aligned with the audit, and then the special education experts can answer the other ones. Uh, but uh, what I'm getting at, if if I'm overwhelmed, I can I can't imagine, and not that I'm any I'm not any smarter or anything than anybody else, but I can't. Some of these parents, I just can't imagine what they go through. Uh, you know, in their attempts to try to get the best service they can for their kids. So that's what I've got to say. Uh, committee members, any other questions? If not, we're moving on. Okay, we're moving on. Item number four, new business. Mr. Fannin, please proceed with the FY23 single audit report. Thank you. Okay, um, well, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to our auditor, Sherry who is uh, here and uh, they did the audit so uh, she can present the, you know, their uh, comments and findings. Sure, thank you, Mr. Fannin. Um, and thank you for having me here this afternoon to present the fiscal year 23 uh, single audit report. Uh, the single audit report is actually an audit of your federal expenditures associated with um, federal grant awards. Um, so when we look at um, doing this audit, we are really um, using the criteria set out by the federal government, Office of Management and Budget, uh, through the uniform guidance and the 2023 compliance supplement uh, that dictates um, how we select our programs um, for the audit. And then once those programs are selected, um, the audit steps or procedures that we go through for each major program um, through the audit process. So um, just wanted to highlight that we are highly dictated by the federal government as those are the ones that grant these federal awards as to um, the audit steps and procedures that we do related to the single audit. Uh, for fiscal year 23, the board had approximately 271 million in federal expenditures. Uh, we are required to test 40% of those expenditures. Um, which will be 108 million. However, um, based on the criteria to select the programs, we selected three major programs that um, totaled approximately $175 million tested or 65% coverage over um, the schedule of expense, expenditures of federal awards. The three major programs that were tested, um, two of them were labeled high risk by the federal government because they had COVID-19 dollars. That's the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds and the education stabilization fund, um, better known as ESSER, um, were the two high risk COVID-19 programs that we picked up and we issued an unmodified audit opinion over both of those programs. The third program we tested was Title I. Um, Title I is, is uh, a standard program um, that the board has from year to year um, and is up for rotation every three years. The last time we tested Title I was in the year 2020, so it was selected um, for testing in 2023 as part of a rotational aspect under the uniform guidance. And we issued a qualified opinion on the Title I program. 
We had three findings related to the single audit report. The first finding was related to the ESSER grant. It was a significant deficiency of our internal control um, related to the allowable cost compliance area. Um, and the crux of this finding was that um, out of 60 expenditures that we tested, we noted two expenditures that not, did, not, did not have documentation of approval over those expenditures charged to the federal grant. Um, and lack of a review or approval of those expenditures could result in expenditures being incorrectly charged to a grant program. So we recommend uh, that the board maintain the documentation to show that there's um, review and approval of expenditures prior to them being um, classified as a federal expenditure. Uh, the second finding we had was related to Title I. This was a significant deficiency in internal control and a compliance finding. Uh, it's finding 23003. Um, this was related to the special test compliance requirement. Uh, the board is required to verify eligibility of private school children before they provide equitable services under the Title I grant. Um, eligible private school children are those that reside in a participating public school attendance area and have educational needs. And we noted one out of eight students tested uh, where the student uh, was not eligible for services under Title I uh, because they were not in the appropriate Title I attendance area um, under the uh, grant program. And we just recommend that the board revise their policies and procedures to include a step that makes sure that they are aligning um, the student's residence with the Title I school eligibility um, attendance areas. And then the next finding was 23004. This was a uh, also a Title I finding. It was a material weakness in internal control and a compliance finding um, for the special another, another special test requirement. Um, MSD requires the board to provide data for students that no longer attend a school in the district. Um, the data is used to determine if the board's graduation rate is affected because of the student's departure. Uh, out of 40 um, students tested, we noted 26 where the board did not maintain documentation to support the student's withdrawal and or evidence of the school's review and approval of the student's withdrawal that was reported to MSDE. Um, and if inaccurate graduation rate reporting could um, result in improper calculation of the board's um, graduation rate, rate at the school at the MSD level. So we recommend the board enhances policies and procedures to ensure it retains the documentation necessary to support the withdrawal of students and it's available for audit purposes. Um, those are the three findings that we had for the single audit. I would be glad to take any questions. Committee members, any questions? This is board member from Pong. I have a question. This is more for the, long, please. Thank you. This is more for the BCPS staff. I don't expect that our external auditor would have this information, but I guess based on the findings of this audit, have we already determined then what policies um, and or rules need to be updated? Um, I can address that. Yeah, this is Pat Fannin. Um, Yes, we have, and we are required to do a corrective action plan for each of these findings. And the one where we had a couple expenditures weren't approved, that was a situation where both the uh, person that had the uh, credit card and their supervisor were both out on long-term medical leave unexpectedly. So it, it took a long time to, to get that stuff together and it, you know, we couldn't get them to approve it. So the accounting office ended up having to approve it. And that's not the normal scenario. Um, the Title I issue with um, the private school eligibility, they have uh, modified their procedures to do a, a second verification of the eligibility and address. Um, and the one on the um, high school cohort documentation, it's important to note that a significant number of those that were tested were during or shortly after the COVID shutdown, and it was very difficult for the schools to get information, you know, from parents and identify. There was a lot of kids that left, and 
So it wasn't easy getting that documentation. However, our, uh, as soon as that was reported, our student services folks, we reached out to them and they were actually getting ready to start training the people in the schools about this very issue about, you know, maintaining this data. And they've included that in their training as well. So I think we've covered everything. Thank you. Ms. Frempong, are you satisfied with that answer? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. My, I was muted. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Um, this Any is other Ms. Lichter. This yes, is Ms. Please, Lichter. Um, I think mine was along the same lines as far as next steps. Um, usually with the other reports, the corrective action plan is usually included, but I think you just went over that. Um, so it's not as formal a plan as some of the other ones, it sounds like. Will we be given an update as far as one um, about the corrective action plan or does this end it here? Um, so, well, there, the corrective action plan is included in the, the report, and um, I believe the auditors, Sherry, can confirm they typically follow up on these yes. things the next year. Okay, okay, so that's what I was just going to say. We will, right. Next year, when we do the single audit for FY24, we'll follow up on the findings for FY23. If they are not resolved, um, we are required to carry them forward into next year's report okay. as a, a separate attachment. Okay, thank you. I just couldn't figure okay. out the word follow up. That's what I meant. When, when, <laughs> when, so thank you for that. <laughs> sure. Okay. Anybody else? I want to thank everybody involved in this audit and all the people who worked on the special education audit, audit for all of their efforts. Uh, item number five is announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, April 9th, 2024 at 4 30 p.m. And I want to I want to say this, you know, my phone number is 410-687-5242. If anybody in the listening public has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'll give you my email address. It's rod, R-O-D dot McMillian, M-C-M-I-L-L-I-O-N at bcps.org. So please, I've got a number of questions. I'm going to follow through with those. If you have uh any other additional questions, please send them to me and I'll attempt to, the best I can to get you answers for those. Okay, for those individuals invited to the closed session, please join by, by using the closed session teams meeting link. It's a little bit different than we've done before because they changed the format. So we're going to officially close out of the open and we're going to reopen under the new link for the closed. So thank Mr. you very much for attending today's Mr. meeting. Mr. McMillian, Mr. Yes. McMillian. Excuse me, I think you need to make a motion to go into closed. Gotcha. Thank you very much. At this time, may I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Opens Meeting Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Article 3-305B10 to discuss public security. If the public body determines that the if the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including one, the deployment of fire and police services and staff, and number two, the development and implementation of emergency plans. Now, I wanna read that again and see if I can get a little bit clearer. At this time, may I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the a Opens Meeting Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Article 3-305B10 to discuss public security, if the public body determines that public discussion would constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including one, the deployment of fire and police services and staff, and number two, the emergency and implementation of emergency plans. Can I have that motion? So moved, Lichter. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. Can I have a motion, a second? Second from Paul. Thank you very much. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. It has been properly moved and seconded that we convene a closed session to discuss this matter. Now we're going to close out of this and we're going to move on to the link for the closed. So thank you very much. And I've been told we're going to be ejected from this meeting. So. Let's see what happens. Thank you.